Welcome. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Myself, Karen Vaz, with Minnesota Department of Health Source Water Protection Unit, and Aaron Meyer, Minnesota Rural Water, will be presenting today's webinar on how to develop well-written wellhead protection management strategies. The previous webinars have discussed very important elements of wellhead protection planning, the data elements, the potential contaminant source inventory, and in my opinion, the most important element of the wellhead protection plan is the management strategies or plan of action. I will be covering the following topics. What is a management strategy? What is the purpose of developing well-written management strategies? What makes a management strategy effective in a wellhead protection plan? And what are the components of a management strategy? Aaron Meyer will be discussing a mock wellhead protection scenario and discussing the do's and don'ts in developing management strategies. And he will also be presenting the importance of well-written management strategies as they relate to the Wellhead Protection Plan amendments, audits, and grants. Um, he will also then wrap up uh, the webinars with an emphasis on how management strategies tie the entire Wellhead Protection Plan together. We would just ask that you hold your applause until the very end. Thank you. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> Okay, what is a management strategy? Uh, well, it's very simple. It's the action to be taken by the public water supply with the assistance from agencies, local government units, volunteers, city staff for the purpose of implementing uh, wellhead protection measures at a proposed time. Implementation of the management strategies are to prevent potential contaminants from entering wells or other sources used by public water supply systems. They're often referred to as plan of action, measures, or management strategies. All of these terms meaning the same thing, the action to be taken by the public water system. Um. What is the purpose of a management strategy? It's to provide direction to a community to accomplish goals. A roadmap to provide direction to the public water system in accomplishing the goals and objectives that were identified in the wellhead protection planning process. For example, if a public water supply identifies a goal to educate the residents of a community on the importance of well sealing, the public water supply has a starting place with management strategies to address unused, unsealed wells. Mm -hmm. Secondly, management strategies are developed to protect ground and surface waters by managing potential contaminants identified in the PCSI, or as we refer to the potential contaminant source inventory. Knowing how those contaminants can be managed gives the public water supply direction in preventing the potential contamination of the source of their drinking water supply. So what makes a management strategy effective? SMART, just like this cute kid. The SMART concept can assist with the development of well-written management strategies. It can also assist with determining if a management strategy will be effective. It's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and last, timely. Let's start with specific. Specific is, is it clearly understandable? For example, what needs to be accomplished? When does it need to be completed? And who's going to take the action? And who can assist with the implementation? Clear and concise, not only understandable to the person writing the management strategy, but by anyone who reads it and needs to take action on it. Well, the new well operator or wellhead protection manager, city council or city clerk or even an MDH planner, be able to understand what action needs to be taken 
now and in the future. As many of you are aware, um, players often change throughout the um, 10 years that a well head protection plan is, is being implemented. And so I just want to emphasize to keep in mind when writing um, management strategies that you're writing them for a number of people. And in most cases, it'll probably be uh, written or read by someone who wasn't involved in the planning process. So keep that in mind. Um, as you can see in this um, example here, um, we've got a wellhead protection measure that identifies what will be done. Um, they're going to mail out a survey. Who it's going to go out to, the landowners within the Twisma. Uh, what's going to be done, um, they're going to identify any unused unsealed wells um, within the Dwisma, um, in, in particular on the landowner's property. And then they're going to also um, inform them about um, the ability of source water protection grant funds to um, assist with the uh, costs associated with sealing those wells. Um, we've got a priority. We prioritize it as high. Um, all unused unsealed wells are a high priority within all DWISMA vulnerabilities. Um, the objective um, came from the data collection. They were looking for additional information about potential contaminants that may have been um, in the DWISMA. And then the next, the time frame. They've identified that as a high priority, so the time frame for implementing this particular management strategy was determined to be in the first year of implementation. Um, they've got an uh, estimated cost. And then, as you can see, they've included the cooperators. And all of these items are uh, required as being part of the uh, management strategies as they're um, identified within the plan. The next um, in our SMART concept is measurable. Um, and measurable as in does the public water supply clearly understand what they need to do and, and how they should actually document their action. Um, these come in um, very helpful um, during evaluations and also um, documentation is an important part of the audit process where you need to document the activities that you've included um, in your plan. And you can see here, this documentation would be a copy of the survey um, and it would have identified any unused unsealed wells information that they had collected. Um, when it should be accomplished, like I mentioned earlier, we've identified this to be done in the first year of the plan. Um, it was a high priority. And it ha is quantifiable um, and measurable. Um, a specific task is associated with this with a number of wells to be sealed as the outcome. And obviously, it can be documented um, with a list of uh, property owners and unsealed wells and a copy of the survey that was sent out to the property owners. Other um, examples of documentation um, to, um, could be um, letters, um, a record of a meeting, um, brochures, uh, web shots, um, photos, um, emails, anything that can substantiate um, the action being taken. Now we'll move on now to whether or not a particular management strategy is achievable by a public water supply. Um, this is very important to keep in mind. Um, because we do not uh, want to set a public water system up for failure in implementing their wellhead protection plan. For example, um, a small community with limited staff, limited resources, and water quality issues probably could not achieve an outcome from a management strategy that states the public water supply will work with an area agricultural producers to reduce the amount of nitrogen that is entering the aquifer. First of all, this is not achievable for any um, small community public water system without the assistance of state, local, and other agencies. Uh, it's not specific and, and it's not measurable for them. Instead, it could read, uh, the public water supply will link information to the local SWCD website regarding egg BMPs, 
um, or the public water supply will request assistance from the SWCD to promote the use of ag BMPs by ag producers within their DWISMA. Just a, an example of um, how measures need to um, be written in a way that the public water supply um, has an opportunity to um, succeed at implementation. Relevant in our smart concept um, is potential contaminants or drinking water issues to minimize the public water supply. Now, management strategies should address issues opportunities, problems, goals, and objectives that have been identified within the Wellhead Protection Plan. Oh, just uh, I'm going to take a little stop here. And if you could uh, please remember to mute your phone by using the star six. Um, it will make it uh, much more clear for everyone to be able to uh, hear the webinar. That's relevant. Um, I'll just repeat this um, because it is very important that the management strategies address issues, opportunities, problems, goals, yep, okay. and the objectives that were identified within the planning process and were included within the plan. And make sure that they are relevant. Do not develop a management strategy if it was not identified in the planning process or was identified as a potential contaminant or its inventory. For example, a low vulnerability DWISMA, a management strategy stating, send out SSTS owner's manuals to all residents within the DWISMA who are not connected to municipal sanitary sewer services. That would not be relevant since SSTSs or sewage treatment systems are not a potential contaminant for a protected aquifer in a non-vulnerable or low vulnerability DWISMA. What would be relevant in this scenario would be the public water supply will identify unused, unsealed wells within the DWISMA, assist the property owners with costs associated with sealing the unused, unsealed wells, and they will do this by applying for source water protection grants. <coughs> Timing. Each action needs a specific time frame. Um, we touched on this when we referred to um, the components of a wellhead protection measure, the priority, the objective, the time frame, the cost, cost and the cooperator. Um, time frames can be ongoing, as needed, continuous. Um, the activities can be spread out during the 10 years of implementation of the plan. Um, highest priority uh, wellhead protection measures should be completed early in the plan implementation. Some of the objectives can be completed multiple times within the 10-year time frame. Um, it may be necessary to um, mm -hmm. revisit um, a particular issue um, at various time frames uh, throughout the life of the wellhead plan. For example, um, you may want to um, hold um, an educational opportunity. Um, say the, you're going to support a children's water festival that incorporates uh, groundwater. Um, those water festivals um, are annually, um, but maybe your involvement would be every year. It could be ongoing. Um, maybe you want to um, inventory unused, unsealed wells at another date later um, in the, in the uh, life of the plan. Um, some management strategies um, can be completed later. Um, obviously, we've got some time. Um, we've got 10 years to um, implement these wellhead protection management strategies. For example, a management strategy developed to uh, collect data for future planning purposes could be done at a later date but it would be need to be done early enough to be used for future uh, plan amendments, um, say uh, year six. And keep in mind that the 
source water protection um, grant cycle is in place uh, when determining these time frames. Um, management strategies could be broken down into multiple activities. And grants can be applied for twice a year um, if the grant monies that are received are used uh, prior to the next grant cycle opportunity. An activity with multiple actions associated, for example, could be clean up a contamination site. A uh, grant could be applied for um, earlier in the year to uh, clean this uh, source of contamination up. And then in the fall, when the next round of grants are available, um, they could apply for a grant to reclaim the site with uh, new soil or vegetation. So that would be an example of uh, breaking a management strategy down into uh, components or individual activities um, with the ability to then to maximize the grant opportunities. <coughs> Pardon me. Remember to use realistic and attainable completion dates. Use specific years, ongoing, as needed, or as occurs. Okay, so in this slide, I just want to talk about how management strategies relate to the entire plan. Um, you can think of it as probably being the the spoke in a, in a, in a bicycle wheel, um, the main cog, but um, they need to be developed for missing data elements or additional uh, data that is needed, maybe isotope sampling, well information. Uh, so you can have management strategies to address data elements, potential contaminants that were identified within the potential contaminant source inventory. Um, management strategies are developed um, to implement that. Um, changes and impacts of changes that were identified in the planning process. Uh, for example, if a large water user is moving into the community, uh, a management strategy could be developed to reflect this change or impact to the water supply of this large water user. That management strategy would address um, the need to look at a new well um, or maybe possibly even um, putting in uh, some conservation measures uh, so that they could uh, minimize the need for a new well but yet uh, be able to provide um, an adequate supply of water to the business. Issues, opportunities, and problems. Um, they need management strategies associated with them. Um, an issue, for example, um, a public water system has identified uh, water quality issues. Um, and they have an opportunity to work with the local SWCD to address uh, problems um, associated with the inability to um, manage um, the land uses that may be associated with the water quality issue. Goals and objectives um, that have been identified within the plan are also uh, directly related to the management strategies. Uh, if you have identified a specific goal um, that you would like to accomplish within the plan, public water supply will need a management strategy to address those goals and objectives. And then lastly, um, the need to prioritize the management strategies based on the goals and objectives. And just as an overview of the management strategies, uh, I just uh, wanted to include this slide to show that um, issues, opportunities, and problems, changes, potential contaminant source inventories, data collection, goals and objectives, all need to um, be connected to the management strategies. Okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, show you a few of the tools that the Minnesota Department of Health and Minnesota Rural Water have available. Um, there are a number of management strategies that have been um, developed uh, for particular uh, parts of the plan. And one of those 
is a number of fact sheets on our uh, Minnesota Department of Health website. And what they we ref would refer to as our white papers um, that will discuss uh, various issues, uh, stormwater, uh, mining, SSTSs, um, above and below ground storage tanks, and feedlots. So if you um, go to our website and uh, look at the fact sheets, um, you will find some valuable information that can be included in your uh, development of your uh, management strategies. Additional information and tools can be found at our Minnesota Rural Water website. Um, the Minnesota Rural Water website has a number of fact sheets related to um, potential source, potential contaminant sources. They have news releases uh, for all these facts, for all these uh, topics, and they have brochures developed. So if you um, go to this website um, and click on any one of these, um, maybe wells, uh, class fives, unused wells, above ground storage tanks. Um, each of those includes a news release or a brochure um, associated with them to be used by the public water supply in implementation. And these um, tools will be uh, posted on the Minnesota Rural website uh, for you to access. Um, make copies of and use in your uh, work with the public water supplies in wellhead protection planning. Oh. Crafting language and measures to be flexible enough to use different types of media for outreach. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think we've all noticed that in the last 10 years, things that used to be easily um, sent out in the mail, um, I think, you know, you have to remember what technologies are available to a particular public water system that you're working with. Obviously, if you're working with a wellhead um, protection plan for a community in the metro area, um, those technologies could drastically change within the next 10 years. I mean, I mean, we have, you know, Twitter and Facebook and things like that. Um, and we know that they all have um, access to um, the Internet. However, there are communities in some parts of the state that, you know, the clerk is just starting to um, be able to understand how to use her computer and, and email. Uh, so I think I would really, you know, take a look at the community you're working with. And then, you know, maybe look at some words to refer to um, how you're going to um, post or present um, certain information. You know, you say you want to educate. What are the avenues uh, to educate them in? Um, maybe they have a website up. So you'll say you're going to um, post information on the website, um, possibly, you know, if that technology changes. Um, I think we'll, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, what I guess I'm trying to do is I'm trying to foresee what technologies will be in the future. Um, but maybe you want to take a look at what they have and expand it um, with the idea that in the future they may have, um, for example, a website for their public water system or their community. I don't know if that helped at all, but uh, maybe Aaron, when he um, starts discussing um, the do's and don'ts here, maybe we'll have uh, some answers for you that would be more helpful. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Aaron Meyer, and I'm going to, he's going to start out um, with a mock scenario of a public water system and go through um, the development of management strategies um, as they pertain to this mock scenario. But thank you for your time. Well, good morning, everyone. As Karen mentioned, this is Aaron Meyer. I'm with Minnesota Rural Water Association, and 
I guess first of all, I'd like to start out by thanking Karen. Uh, she did a good job on covering what I believe is what's involved to create um, effective and good management strategies, which you know, when we're dealing with well protection plans and management strategies, in my opinion, are some of the most important parts because that's where the rubber meets the road and that's where implementation occurs to protect the water supply. Um, Karen alluded to it a little bit already, but um, what I'm going to do now is switch gears a little bit and I'm actually going to go through a mock scenario we created for uh, a community here in Minnesota. And I'm actually going to apply some of the, some example management strategies that we created where we applied the SMART uh, acronym to. And then once I get into that part of it, I'm also going to com kind of compare the good and the bad or the do's and the don'ts, whatever you want to call it, between the ones we created and some that we've seen in plans or that we created for our webinar today. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to cover uh, very briefly uh, plan amendments, audits, and grants and in particular how they pertain to management strategies. Once I figure out how to advance the slides that is. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? I did that. Okay. Gotta be smarter than the computer I guess. Um, with this slide I, um, I know a lot of you have probably followed this webinar through the whole series. Um, just in case you haven't, I want to give a little bit of a background as to the scenario that we've talked about previously. So with this slide, I'm, I'm giving more of the 30,000 foot view, and I'll, I'll give you some lower flights with more details in the next slides. Um, in, in our scenario here, we're um, the city of Pretendville. It's, of course, a, a community here in Minnesota. It's population just over 3,000. Uh, we do have two different uh, drinking water supply management areas, and I'll explain them more. But uh, Duisman number one has two wells, and Duisman number two has two wells as well, and they're different vulnerabilities. The, um, where we're at with planned development in this scenario is we have the part one report that's been completed, and it's been developed by the Department of Health. And we are currently uh, embarking and creating the well protection plan part two process, and we've uh, hired a consulting firm named YOU Incorporated. And the city at this point, uh, they have a good uh, safe drinking water supply, so they want they have a general goal that they want to promote public health and economic development by maintaining that safe drinking water supply. <clears throat> um, one thing I want to mention here before I start explaining duism number one is that um, if you downloaded some of the materials uh, prior to our webinar today, you'll probably see that this is slightly different. And what we did here this week is we actually made individual slides for Duisma 1 and Duisma 2 just because we thought it'd flow better and it, um, it'd be a little bit better uh, read on your guys' computers. A little bit better understood. Um, so now with this slide, I'm going to kind of give the information about what Duisma 1 is all involved with. And I'm just going to start out with here. Um, these two uh, stars are wells number 1 and 2. They're approximately 60 feet deep. Um, important thing to note here is that there is no geological protection, um, so we have a highly vulnerable drinking water supply management area. Um, the, another thing of note here is that the Duisma is located primarily south of town. Um, as you can tell by looking at the, uh, the primary land usage here is agriculture uh, with some residential development and light commercial on the northern end of the Duisma closer to city limits. Um, you'll notice, you'll note here that the wells are close to a creek and that the wells are actually located in a floodplain. Um, other things of note here is, is the red line, just since we don't have a legs on this slide, is uh, the emergency response area. The blue line is the computer delineated wellhead protection area, so that's our groundwater flow pass. And the yellow line is our drinking water supply management area. And the water in this situation is moving from a southeast to northwesterly direction. Um, probably some of the most important things to take away from this slide is the fact that the city is experiencing elevated nitrate levels. Um, they have some seasonal fluctuations and they're in that five to seven parts per million. Um, this is important to note because this is above what would be considered naturally occurring. Uh, generally, speak, generally speaking, we consider naturally occurring in that one to two to three range potentially. So there is something happening within the duisma that is 
most likely due to human activities that's causing the nitrate levels to be high, higher than, ex than what should be naturally occurring. Now, as many of you know that are attending this webinar, this is below the, the drinking water standards. So the city, you know, is aware of this and they want to spend some special attention on it, but they're not overly concerned at this point, but they do want to make sure it's a priority in their well protection part two process to tackle this nitrate issue head on. Uh, the other thing you'll, you'll note on this is that we do have high chlorides. Now chlorides per se are, are not a, you know, a, a drinking water issue, but they are very um, a good indicator in the fact that it's a flashy system and that we have some high infiltration rates if we're seeing uh, high chlorides. So what that means is that we really particularly need to look at you know, stormwater runoff, um, spill response, or activities that could be occurring along the transportation corridors inside this highly vulnerable wellhead protection area. And finally, um, as many of you guys know already, but just want to reinforce it here is that high vulnerability means that we're looking at all potential contaminant sources. That would be any type of land use, um, ranging anywhere from what the farmers are putting on their fields to um, stormwater runoff, you know, as far as developments near the wells to uh, wells. So I guess I just want to reinforce that we're looking at all potential contaminant sources with Duisman number one. Now we're switching gears. Um, in this situation, we're looking at the duisma that's on the north side or the upper part of your screens here, and this is duisma number two. In this situation, it's the same in the fact that the stars <coughs> on the end are three and four, and these wells are deeper. They're not 60 feet deep, but now they're 300 feet deep, and they have a lot of good geological protection. So Department of Health has rated this duisma as having a low vulnerability. Uh, one thing of note here is that we do have an old municipal well and it's located right in between wells three and four, and it's no longer being used. It's an old well and it hasn't been sealed, and it is at the same depth as the city well, so it is um, punching through that geological, you know, protective layer, and it could be a potentially, um, you know, high. It is a high priority potential contaminant source that we need to address. Um, probably the final thing on Duisma two that's important to note is that in this situation we are only looking at other wells and class 5 injection wells because of the geological protection that's provided by our uh, glaciers in the past. Um, with this slide I want to start to dive into some of those example management strategies that we created to try to apply the SMART um, philosophy to. And in this situation, we um, developed management strategies for Duisma 1 that address those water quality concerns and issues. In this situation, we developed example management strategies to address the nitrates and the elevated chlorides, which in our situation is stormwater runoff in transportation corridors. And in Duisma number 2, we created some management strategies to deal with the old municipal well, the you know, high priority potential contaminant source and also the lack of good groundwater and geological data. Uh, one thing that was noted in the part one report by Department of Health is that there wasn't a lot of groundwater information or uh, well logs in the area. So they, um, they were looking for some management strategies to help them um, secure better geological information in the future. And that came about from us or through the process of the data elements. So I guess the point I'm trying to make of this slide is that we tried to come up with some example management strategies to address a variety of issues that consultants would typically run across when they're developing the part two planning you know, process or in that part two planning process. Okay, so now in the next um, uh, handful of slides, I'm actually gonna go through kind of the do's and don'ts as I mentioned earlier. On the left-hand side, we're looking in, in the left-hand column, we're looking at the management strategies that we created using the SMART philosophy, and on the right-hand side are some um, example management strategies that we've seen in plans or that we created just to kind of show the differences between the good and the bad. Um, we're starting out with education and outreach, and the reason being, as, reason being is because we have this and all, all well protection plans need to do education and outreach. And in particular, we started with um, a management strategy that deals with wells because no, no matter what vulnerability you're dealing with out there, you have to inventory the wells and you have to educate the landlords that have the wells to make sure that they're not a potential contaminant source. 
So in this situation, I'm just going to start going through these and explain why they're good and maybe why they're not so good. Um, so the first one here in 2015 says that the city is going to mail a copy of the Department of Health well managed brochure to all landowners within the Dwisma. Well, if you start applying the smart, you know, terminology to this, um, it is very specific. And, you know, it's very easily understood by the public water supplier. Um, one thing to remember is, you know, as we're going through the planning process, uh, there's going to be huge turnover in well protection managers across the state in the next few years. Um, as you probably noticed, a lot of those guys are reaching retirement. So we have to always anticipate that there's going to be somebody else that's going to be implementing these plans in the future, and it's most likely not the person that's actually in the planning process that you're when you're writing the plan itself. So I guess what I want to point out with this man, the strategy is that this is something that a well protection manager can pick up five years from now, and he can understand the specifics of this, and that he needs to mail a copy of the well protection or the well management brochure to all landlords within the Dwisma. You know, so that's something that's clearly stated what he's going to do. It's got a time frame stamped with it. He's going to do it in 2015. You know, that could be 2020. You know, depending on the situation. Um, it's measurable in the fact that. Um, when we need to have documentation, it's measurable in the fact that you can record how many copies of the brochure were mailed out to the various landowners. And is it relevant? It's, um, and is it achievable? It's very relevant because you're addressing a potential contaminant source that's most likely present in all well protection areas. And it's definitely achievable. Every public water supplier can handle mailing out some brochures to landowners within the Dwisma. Now on the, uh, the don't side of the table here, um, you know, the management strategy says provide well management education materials. Well, this in, in its own is not a terrible management strategy because you're providing education materials to, you know, to do better the management of wells within your Dwisma. You know, where this management strategy is lacking in the fact it doesn't talk about when you're going to do it. Um, it doesn't, it just needs a lot more detail a lot more, you know, specification as to what you're going to do. Like who are you going to send it to? Are you going to, are you going to just send it to everybody in town? Or you could have a town that has 3,000 people and, you know, 2,995 people maybe don't have a well. Well, you don't necessarily need to send it to all of them. Instead, you only need it to send it to those that have wells, that could likely have wells. Um, switching gears now. Um, on the, the good side of the table, um, this measure is in 2015. It says that the city is going to place copies of the education materials, in this situation, the fact sheets and brochures. And I like to usually tell people to go to the Rural Water website or Department Health's website for a lot of this stuff. And that these fact sheets and brochures are going to address the proper management of the potential contaminant source identified in the well protection plan, and that they're going to place these education materials on a wall display at City Hall. Now, in my opinion, this one um, is, is a well-written one. This is something that's pretty common in a lot of well protection plans, and it's something that is definitely achievable by um, public water suppliers and the fact that a lot of times they have wall displays and a lot of times they're looking for materials to put on those wall displays. So, And there's a lot of towns, particularly the smaller towns, where there's a lot of traffic that comes into City Hall, you know, paying utility bills, coming in with different questions. So it's a good place to put education materials. So in this situation, if we apply the smart, you know, terminology to it, it has a time frame assigned to it. We're going to do it in 2015. You know, is it um, specific? It's very specific in that you're placing education materials, and you're not only saying education materials, but you're specifying that those education education materials must address the proper management of the potential contaminant sources identified in your wellhead protection plan. You know, I like to point that out to people that. You know, if you only have septics and storm water and tanks to worry about, you know, you don't need to have education materials for all potential contaminant sources that could be out there. You instead need to have education materials only addressing the ones you identified in your wellhead protection area. And furthermore, it's it's very specific in the fact that you're you're mentioning where you're going to put those education materials and even where you could get them. Um, it's relevant the fact that. When you're dealing with well protection plans, as many of you know, you have to conduct a potential contaminant source inventory, which you know Mark and Beth did a really good job explaining in our previous webinar. 
and that any potential contaminant source you identify, you must have a management strategy that talks about how you're going to address that potential contaminant source. On the uh, the not so good side of the table again, um, the management strategy here just says place wellhead protection education materials in city hall. Um, it's a good measure, you know, it it, it has good con good content. It just needs to add more detail to our previous, similar to our previous one. You know, we need to say when you're going to do it, and then also some specification of what do you mean by wellhead protection education materials? Are you dealing with water conservation? Um, are you dealing with you know, a variety of stuff that maybe doesn't pertain to that individual well protection plan itself. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears again, and now I'm going to dive into the example management strategies that we created for dualism number one and then dualism number two. And in these, I'm going to cover management strategies, in, in particular the ones that are dealing with water quality concerns. Um, if you have a water quality concern, you must have management strategies to address those issues. Um, that is the number one priority in well protection plans is to protect the water supply. So if you have some kind of red flag that tells you that your water quality is, you know, trending the wrong direction or you're, you know, you have something in your water, you must address that. So and you'll find in this first management strategy here that right away in 2015, we're going to tackle, tackle the nitrate issue because we have elevated nitrate in our groundwater. So on the good side here, it says in 2015, we're going to convene a meeting, local, state, and federal agencies who are working with ag producers to develop a plan to address nutrient management issues within the DWISMA. Can I take this a uh, quick moment to ask you guys to mute your phones again? I think there's at least two of you guys that are not muted right now. Thank you. Um, one other reason why we wanted to have some example management strategies dealing with nitrates is in the fact that this is, in my opinion, a, a notoriously hard management strategy to develop. Uh, municipalities are not geared up to work of ag producers. Um, you know, cities or municipalities are designed to work within their city limits, and they have rules and regulations for that. But once you get outside of city limits, it's not their expertise, and they really feel uncomfortable with it. So one thing that I recommend for public water suppliers to do when they have nitrate issues is to convene a meeting with the local, state, and federal agencies who work with the ag producers. In this situation, it would be your local soil and water conservation districts. It would be a Minnesota Department of Ag. It would be your Natural Resource Conservation Service. Those are the people that are meeting with those ag producers on you know, a pretty frequent basis. They usually know them by name. And ask those people to come together to develop a management plan on how to address the you know, night, uh, nutrient management issues within your drinking water supply management area. Now, if you if you apply the smart terminology to this one, um, in my opinion, it's a good one because it talks about when you're going to do it. You're going to do it in 2015, and you prioritize that in the fact that you're doing it earlier in the plan rather than later in the plan because it's a water quality issue. Um, the thing that's easily documented and um, achievable by the city in this situation is the fact that the city is going to convene a meeting. So you know, every city can reach out to these agencies and offer to have a meeting, invite them to a meeting, and help to facilitate that meeting. Um, also, another thing that's measurable or, you know, can be documented in this situation is that there will be a nutrient manager plan, you know, created. Um, and I'd also recommend that a lot of these people should be included in your planning process. They should be invited to your wellhead protection team meetings. And as you develop these management strategies, you want to have their local buy-in into these management strategies, so they're, they come to this meeting and they're ready to, you know, take the bull by the horns and start working on things. Um, it's specific in the fact that you know what you're going to do. Um, it's definitely achievable, and it's definitely relevant in the fact that you're attacking the nitrate issue. Um, on the the don't side of the table here, you know, you know, you have a measure that says you're going to address the nitrate issues. However, it's, it's just too generic and just too plain. And this is actually management strategies we have seen in plans. So it just needs more details, more timely, you know, a time stamp place to it. And it's just, you know, if a well protection manager comes, he's hired and he starts 10 years from now or eight years from now, you know, they're probably not going to have a very good idea of how to address the nitrate issues unless you give them some more detail in your management strategy. You know, one thing to remember is that, you know, when you're developing strategies, when you leave the table, you know, Communities need to be able to understand these and implement them because if they're not able to implement them, you know, they're just 
they're just poised to fail from the very beginning. Um, the second manager strategy that we have to deal with nitrates is a little bit, you know, probably more easily understood. It's a, it just says that in 2015, the city will contact the Natural Resource Conservation Service and the Department of Ag and obtain fact sheets, which they have created and have on hand and are using more than willing to provide, which, pro, which promote nitrogen best manager practices, and that you're going to mail those brochures to the landowners within the DWISMA. Clear cut, easily understood, it says when you're going to do it. It says who's your cooperators, who are the people going to help you. Um, the city in this situation can show or can document that they contact an NRCS, they can you know, save the email, they can send them a letter. Um, it's, you know, it's definitely measurable, you know, because you can do all this kind of stuff. You can keep a number, you know, keep a copy of what was mailed out and who it went to and all those types of things. So I mean, it's definitely relevant. On the uh, don't side of it, um, this measure actually isn't absolutely terrible. The content is good. It says you're going to provide education materials to ag producers. It just like a lot of the other management strategy just needs more thought, needs a little bit more details included into, you know, what are you going to send? Are you going to send education materials to ag producers dealing with nitrogen management? Or are you going to send them education materials on they should not cut their alfalfa until X number of days for forage content? I mean, that's probably kind of a crazy example to use, but the idea here is you need to be more specific so people understand what kind of education materials you're going to send out, when you're going to send them out, and so forth. Um, now switching gears now, diving into the stormwater runoff on, and the um, um, chloride issues. Um, the, the example manager strategy that we created for Pretendo was that in 2016, the city is going to convene a meeting comprised of staff from the city public works department and the county highway department to discuss the importance of managing chloride levels and provide education materials to educate them on proper salt usage, storage, and truck calibration. I'm not going to go into this a lot of details because it's very similar to a lot of the other ones we discussed. Um, one thing I want to mention here is that we did put this as a year later. Uh, you noted it's in 2016 rather than 2015. In this situation, we did a year later because nitrates are a bigger issue, in our opinion, because they're they're a health standard and they're elevated and they are approaching that you know that drinking water standard of 10 parts per million. But however, the chloride elevated chloride show that we do have a flashy system, and that we need to be worried about stormwater runoff and spills along transportation corridors because they could be you know a quick conduit to get fluids into the drinking water supply. So just briefly on this one, you know it's. It's relevant the fact that you're you have some good information in there. You're you're educating people on on why chlorides are important. Um, you're giving them some education materials, and you're giving them education materials that deal with you know the usage of salts. You're not overusing salt. How to store it so it's not being you know wasted or carried away in rain events. And finally, when you're applying it, also you're dealing with the truck calibration. So um, this is a good measure on kind of a tough one to to battle sometimes. On the don't side. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this uh, with the time frame here, but you know, reduce chloride levels. Yeah, that's a no-brainer. You want to do that, but this this measure here, you need a lot more details as how you're going to do it. Um, you know, reduce chloride levels levels could mean just are you not going to use chloride or you know salt for the roads, or are you just going to use sand? You know, so just a lot more details for public water suppliers to help them through the implementation process. Okay, now we're switching gears. And we're going to deal a little bit more with stormwater, um, and not so much with the chlorides, but actual stormwater and spill response. And we just have two management strategies here. These are ones that we see quite often in well protection plans. Um, maybe not so much in the stormwater end, but we want to use this as an example. So on the on the good side of it, it just says that in 2018, the city is going to explore retrofitting or relocating uh, the outlet of a of a stormwater system to um, to a location that's away from wells one and two. Um, we do not want to have, because of our high infiltration rates here, we don't want to have stormwater brought from another location and being dumped near wells one and two and then rapidly infiltrating and getting into the city's water supply. So in this situation, that in 2018, we push it off a few years once again, you know, to, so we could tackle nitrates, but the city is going to explore retrofitting or relocating options. Um, this is a good one because it's relevant. You're dealing with the stormwater issues, you know, the, uh, the transport of potential contaminant sources closer to the wells. It's achievable in the fact that the city can 
you know, has a few years to start to look for the funding options, for the grant opportunities. It's got a time frame. We're doing it in 2018. We're doing it just a couple years after, you know, tackling the nitrate issue. And it's documented, you know. You can look at, you know, measurable. In fact, you can look at options, you know. You can look at engineering plans. You can look at various, you know, things. So, you know, it's a, it's a good management strategy. On the, on the don't side of it, just says reduce storm water runoff. Well, that once again is not a bad management strategy, it just needs more detail. You know, if a well protection manager, new one comes on board in five years from now, and he reads, you know, reduce storm water runoff, he doesn't know what that means. It's just too vague, once again. Um, on the bottom left hand side here, we do have one management strategy that deals with spill response. Um, and in this situation, we just said in 2016, the city will convene a meeting with local emergency response personnel and agencies to develop a spill response protocol. You know, for spill that may occur within their drinking water supply management area. Um, this meets a spart, the SMART analogy very well in the fact that you're going to do it in 2016. It's measurable in the fact that the city can measure the fact that they're convening a meeting. They can document who attended, when the meeting was held. They have an example agenda. And finally, you can actually have a spill response protocol or document created because it's definitely a good, you know, documentation tool. And, um, and on the, uh, the, the don't side of it, you know, purchasing spill response equipment, um, that's a good idea. We see that in, you know, a fair number of plans. However, um, what kind of spill response equipment is that going to be? You know, where are you going to get it? You know, have the, have the first responders you know, been educated as to why they need to get spill response equipment. Do they know where the well protection area is? So in this management strategy, we just need to have a little bit more detail, a little bit more background, and definitely some more time frames as to when it's going to occur and so forth. <clears throat> okay, we have one slide here that's going to deal with the example management strategies we created for Duisman number two. And the big difference here is that this is a low vulnerable uh, drinking water supply management area. So in this situation, we try to come up with some different examples that fit for low vulnerable well protection areas because they're typically a little bit harder to come up with stuff. There's usually not as much, you know, activities going on. So in this situation, the part one report that MDH created, you know, identified a lack of good groundwater information or geological information. So we wanted to create a measure that in 2020, the city will contact the Department of Health hydrologists and based upon their recommendations, install continuous water level monitoring and recording equipment in one of the public water supply wells. So this would be something that would give them some good groundwater information. Um, it has a time frame on it and the measurable action here from the city is the fact that they can show that they're contacting the Department of Health hydrologists and that they're going to work in cooperation with the MDH hydrologists to actually install some of this equipment into their wells. It's relevant the fact that you're addressing some of the, the lack of good data that was brought forth through the part one report and through the data elements or data collection part of the plan. On the don't side of the table here, the do or the bad side, um, it just says measure static water levels, which is what you're doing, you know, but just doesn't give a lot of detail as to when you're going to do it, how you're going to do it, and so forth. Um, the next one down, the is going to deal more with the collection, collection of the geological information. Uh, in 2020, the city is going to mail out a survey to all residents within one mile of the Duisma boundary to obtain well log information for new wells drilled between 2015 and 2020. Um, this is a good management strategy in the fact that we will hopefully gain a lot more, you know, well locations and well logs, and those those well logs are critical for helping to build that you know, geological foundation for future amendments. Um, this is a good one in the fact that it's specific. It says that the city is going to mail out a survey, and we have lots of surveys that are out there. You just have to contact your friendly departmental planner or rural water planner in your area. And that said, it's very specific in the fact that it says where you're going to mail it to. You're going to mail it to residents that are within one mile of the Duisma boundary. And it's very specific in the fact that what are you going to obtain? You're going to obtain well log information. It's relevant in the fact that you're, you're collecting information for future amendments. Um, on the don't side of it, just says identify new wells within one mile of the Duisma. Um, just not enough information like all the other example, poor examples that we've created. You know, why? Why are you identifying new wells? Are you just identifying them because you want to identify them or 
you know, what are you going to gather from that information? Do you need to you need to collect the well logs so we can gather good geological information at the same time? So some good correlations that are made. Um, the final example management strategy that we have is dealing with that old municipal well. And to be honest with you, I probably should have put this at the very front one because this is the highest priority for Duisma number two. Um, and that's why we have it occurring in 2015 that if you have an old municipal well and it's located near your your main active wells and it's in the same depth, it is the most, one of the highest priorities to get that well sealed. So in this situation, the city is going to contact Department of Well Management to ask that they assist with locating the well and sealing that old municipal well. So I think this is pretty straightforward as to it's very specific, it's got a time frame assigned, it's very irrelevant. And on the on the don't side of it, it just says we're going to seal old wells. Well, that's good. We want to seal old wells. We just need to add more detail, you know, as to what wells are going to seal. You know, particularly the wells in this situation that are deeper. If the wells were only 50 feet deep, we really it's not a priority for the public water supply to seal those shallow wells. We're only looking at wells that are probably that you know 200, 250 to 300 foot range. So just a little bit more detail here is critical for um, municipalities. Okay, my uh, last, few, last few slides, I'm going to switch gears now and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the plan amendments, uh, the grants and the audit programs. And I'm not going to spend a lot of details on these. Um, I guess the point I wanted to mention here is that um, plan amendments are becoming you know, more and more of a workload issue. We have lots of amendments that are coming due. And as you guys are starting to do these amendments, one of the first steps you need to do is look at the original plan. You know, look at those management strategies and you know, just go through, you know, what worked, what didn't work, you know, um, what's changed, you know, were the goals and objectives met for the city, and if something didn't work, why didn't it work? Ask them those questions. So, you know, if a city has, you know, momentum going in their well protection plan, the original plan, you want to make sure you continue to build upon that momentum, momentum and create management strategies that, you know, keep that progress going forward. Um, if you're developing new management strategies, of course, you need to apply the SMART terminology but probably one thing I really want to highlight is the fact that we do have higher expectations for amendments. You know, we expect these management strategies to be written more precise, you know, and we want people to really go for some of these, um, you know, critical potential contaminant sources, not so much the low hanging fruit, so to speak, but to really tackle the hard issues. Um, with grants, um, I just want, as many of you probably know, Department of Health has a grant program in place. Uh, they have two different types of grants. I'm not going to go into lots of details. Other than I just want to mention that there is funding out there for implementing well protection plans. Um, and they, in fact, they have one grant that's entirely set up to fund um, management strategies that are identified in well protection plans. And I just want to bring it to your guys' attention that, you know, write these management strategies to maximize these grant opportunities. You know, it's an unfunded mandate, and we do a lot of technical um, assistance to, to folks, you know, with writing part ones and all that kind of stuff, but still, they need some help with implementing plans, and why not maximize their opportunities for getting some of those funds? Um, Karen mentioned this earlier in the webinar, but, you know, if you have a complicated action that's expensive, you might as well separate that out into multiple, you know, management strategies, and each one of those strategies could be, you know, funded via a grant. And just once again, it's kind of common sense, but make sure all the steps are well understood by the public water supplier. Um, audits, this is going to be kind of a short and sweet slide. Um, Department of Health has an audit program. Um, I think pretty much everybody knows that. Um, it's been around for a few years now. And I guess I want to just mention that, you know, as you develop these management strategies for public water suppliers, don't set them up to fail an audit. You know, make sure that these management strategies are understood and Make sure that they can be documented, because if they can't be documented, you know, it's just very hard to have somebody pass an audit if they can't show any kind of documentation of what they did. You know, you want to make sure that the documentation helps to tell the story of what the city did for implementation. And these are just a few examples of what you can have for documentation. You know, they can document phone calls, emails, letters sent, you know, pictures or invoices. So it's just a, a whole bunch of items here that you know, you can use for documentation. So feel free to be creative. Just make sure there's something in there that they can document. Um, just a quick summary here on management strategies. Um, management strategies, like I mentioned earlier, in my opinion, are one of the most important parts of well protection plans. Um, they're basically the glue that keeps the plan together. 
You know, you have to look at the data elements, you have to look at the issues, problems, opportunities, the changes, you know, the potential contaminant sources, and it all boils down into good, effective management strategies. And once again, make sure you apply the smart, you know, terminology to those management strategies. Now, since this is the last webinar, I just want to give a little bit overview, um, you know, how this all fits into the, you know, an overall well protection plan. I know many of you guys know this, but sometimes a refresher is not a bad thing. So I guess one way I like to explain it is um, when you're developing a well protection plan, it's similar to building a legal case or, or writing a book and the fact that you need to go out and you need to collect your evidence or you need to do your, your due diligence in collecting the data or doing your research for your book. So and that's the data collection or data elements as we call it and your potential contaminant source inventory. That's where you're going out and you're trying to build all that evidence that you need for your future court case. Um, then you also need to look at what's going to change in the future. You know, what's going to change in the next 10 years? That's what these plans are looking out, you know, 10 years in advance. What are the issues, problems, opportunities that are facing the city? You know, what do they need to address, you know, in the future so that we don't develop a plan, but then we miss some glaring issue that ultimately really, you know, impedes them from implementing their plan. And finally, you also need to look at your goals and objectives. You know, that's, that's the the part that really kind of helps get the direction to the plan, make sure it's on track. And finally, the management strategy is what is the glue that keeps all these things together. You know, management strategy addresses all these things and makes it all pertinent and that's where the rubber meets the road. And finally, if you, if you consider all of these things, all these items, and you do give them all good due diligence, you know, it, you will have a well-written, concise, well protection plan. Okay, now, um, I know people are located throughout the state here on this webinar, so in this situation I just wanted to show you geographically where you can find your friendly department health planners that are closest to you. And um, a lot of this, inf all this information will be available on the Rural Water website and of course it's available currently on the Department of Health website. And this slide here shows the geographical areas that the uh, Minnesota Rural Water Association planners cover. And then finally, I want to give uh, acknowledgments to my fellow cohorts in Crimer that were on the Management Strategies Work Group, uh, Dave Nyman, um, Jenny Lynn Marchand from up in the Bemidji area, Karen Boz, who you heard her glorious voice a few minutes ago, and myself. And finally, since this is the last webinar in the series, I also wanted to you know, thank you guys for attending. Um, I hope that they were uh, good webinars and you gleaned some good information out of them. I just want to mention here that uh, all the technical tools that we mentioned, materials will be available on the Rural Water website if they're not there already. And that all these sessions have been recorded and they'll be available at the Rural Water website. And that, you know, there'll be a, a, uh, a recording that covers all the four webinars. And just in case you didn't catch the earlier ones, you know, there was a webinar that covered kind of an overview of the well protection planning process. There's a webinar that discussed um, data elements, you know, the review of them and how to gather that information. You know, what was required to complete a potential contaminant source inventory was our latest one. And then finally today's, which is all the, all the items and education and knowledge you need to know to write a well-written effective management strategy. With that, I'll conclude and open up for questions. Looks like we have one question here. Okay, so the question here is, what is the legal basis for your expectation that local government units conduct this work outside the boundaries of their jurisdiction? If managing, if managing potential contaminants sources is so important, why just not require that this be done everywhere? Well, that's actually a very good question. <laughs> um, I guess I'll take it a step at a time here. So the first part is, is, what is the legal basis for your expectations that local government units conduct this work outside the boundaries? Um, well, probably the easiest way to answer this question is, sometimes the local units of government have other priorities. Uh, they have a lot of different, you know, irons in the fire. And in some situations, there is a lot, a lot of strict um, uh, legal controls out there. For example, when you're dealing with nitrate issues, there is no legal controls with um, lo that local units of government can tie into to you know help address the farming community. 
Now that is getting a little bit better with the, the recently approved or soon to be approved uh, nitrogen, nitrogen fertilizer plan. So, I mean, in our situation from, I guess I can't speak for Department of Health directly, but, you know, we can only expect a local, gov local units of government to enforce the rules and regulations that they're entrusted to enforce. And we need to, with their workloads and their issues, we need to make it as easy as possible for them to do that. So if we have septic issues in a well protection area, we need to educate them on the importance of addressing septic issues in that area rather than maybe going to some other area where a public water supply is not in jeopardy of that you know, particular contaminant source. Um, and the second part of the question is, you know, if managing potential contamination sources is so important, why does not require that this be done everywhere? Well, I tell you what, um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. It is important. That's something that needs to start at a much higher level than myself. That needs to be started at the Capitol and with all the other state and federal agencies. That, yeah, that's a good idea. However, getting all those agencies on board with all their own, you know, ideas of what needs to be done is, is the challenge. Any other questions? I have one question. Yep, go ahead. Hello. Uh, this is Terry, and I'm a consultant, and maybe it's more a suggestion than a question, but I seem to have to ask for a lot of pieces from the planners, such as sometimes I need the part one because the copy that the city has has copy on it, or I need shape files for Mike Baker, and I always go through the planner to get these items, maybe a land cover map. Um, would it be helpful if we had a form that we could just fill out what we need for these plans and submit it back to our planner and and then they could do it all at one time? It's just a thought. Um, well, thank you, Terry, for the comment. Um, yeah, I guess I can only speak for myself here, but I think anything that you guys feel would help you know, improve efficiencies and make your guys' jobs easier and ultimately make our jobs easier, uh, you know, from a plan development and review standpoint, that if you guys have suggestions on how that could be improved, I, I mean, I can't speak for Department of Health, but I think they would be open to those ideas because, you know, why not if it's something that would make your guys' easy, jobs easier. Okay. Thank you, and thanks for the education. Yep. Any other uh, questions? Aaron, this is another Terry. Hey, Terry. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, non-vulnerable uh, measures template. Uh, does MDH plan on revising or updating that to uh, uh, using the SMART approach? That would be one question. The, the second question is, uh, is there any plan to create a vulnerable measures template uh, similar to the non-vulnerable one? And well, that, that's enough for now. Yeah, don't give me too many questions in a row. Um, the answer to your first question, Terry, is yes, Department of Health is going to revisit the non-vulnerable template and apply the SMART, you know, terminology to that. Um, in regards to your second question is, are they going, are they planning on creating a, a management strategy template for vulnerable situations? And the answer to that is I'm not really for sure. I think at the present time it's probably not the highest priority, but I think it's something that they are definitely interested in doing sometime in the future. As a follow-up to that, Aaron, uh, regarding nitrates, uh, I'm hearing the words, uh, the word consistency, if you will. The, the message needs to be pretty consistent, I think, to these state agencies. Is there any attempt to uh, f uh, formulate some measures regarding nitrates uh, that public water suppliers then uh, have a consistent approach towards uh, addressing that particular issue? Um, I guess, first of all, as far as the consistency, um, I think that the state, local, state, and federal agencies are really becoming more aware of well protection and source water protection just in the last couple of years. I know um, NRCS is, you know, making some special, creating some special initiatives to tackle source water. So I do think that there is some consistencies, you know, as far as where the priorities are for local, state, and federal agencies in dealing with well protection areas. And I do think that we are moving towards creating some more consistent, you know, ag-related management strategies for public water suppliers to use just because it is a difficult one and because literally public water suppliers can't do a lot without cooperation from local, state, and federal agencies. So 
I think we're getting better about creating the awareness of those agencies and also getting their buy-in, you know, to assist the communities. And I think we're doing a better job, and we can be better at this too, Terry, creating those management strategies that we can kind of give public water suppliers to put in their plans so they're consistent across the state. So it makes it easier for a state, you know, for local, state, and federal agencies to implement plans because they can tie into multiple plans because they have, you know, for when they go for grants or for funding, they can reference local you know, well protection plans because they're consistent across the board. You know, so I think it's easier to find some of that funding too from outside the agencies. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, I have one more here in the room. Okay. Um, the question here is, can you clarify why you want information on wells outside the DWISMA? Isn't it more important to collect information within the DWISMA? <clears throat> Um, that's a good question. I probably should have a better job of clarifying that, but um, in our situation, when we're looking for wells outside the drinking water supply mansion area, we're looking at that primarily, well, there's a couple different reasons. First of all, we usually want to know those well locations and ultimately the well logs, so we can look at those well logs to help build that geological framework, so, you know, for future delineations to make sure we can, you know, fine-tune delineations and make sure we're protecting the areas that are most appropriate. Um, sometimes we are looking at wells outside the Duismas for other reasons and the fact that if you have a high capacity well, a well that's pumping 10,000 gallons a day or a million gallons a year, you know, if, they, if it's a new well is created or drilled or if there's new wells that have different pumping regimes, it could potentially change the flow paths and could potentially change the boundaries of our well protection areas. And theoretically it could change, you know, groundwater flow directions and if we, in the Twin Cities, if you have a plume, you know, if you change the flow patterns, it could change the direction of that plume and ultimately impact the public water supplier without them, you know, knowing it unless you know what those pumping rates are and those well locations and so forth. Any other questions? Got some good ones here. I guess if that's it, I thank you guys for all attending today's webinar. Thanks. Bye-bye.